so we have hit the magic 100. You are all the good children who came early. And am I on? Yes, who came early. So you got in. Um, so this is Catherine Lamprecht. I do programs for culinary historians, Chicago Foodways Roundtable, it's the same thing. And uh, Illinois Mycological Association. And this is a joint meeting tonight. So I'd like to introduce to you to Ileana. Oh, Elena Reagan. I, I had she had to give me a pronunciation guide because <laughs> I was wrong. Sorry, madam. Uh, she's a, a Michelin star chef and restaurateur in the Hiawatha National Forest. That's in the upper UP, which, by the way, she it's snowing there or about to snow. I'm not quite sure which. Um, so she's the owner of the Milkweed Inn in Wetmore, Michigan, and she's received one Michelin star for each year. She owned and operated Elizabeth Restaurant in Chicago from 2012 to 2020. Um, Elena was born in Merrillville, Indiana. Her mother was a scratch cook and her steelworker father was a gardener. And she and her three older sisters grew up on a 10 acre farm where she learned a lot about foraging. Um, she studied chemistry at Indiana University Bloomington before earning a degree in creative writing at Columbia College Chicago. In the spring of 2022, she earned her Master's of Fine Arts, I guess, from, sorry, from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And at least two of our mycologists teach at the um, Institute of the uh, Art Institute. And so she's there with her dogs and her wife. And if the dogs bark, we will just let it play out because you know, that's what dogs do. All right, Eliana, uh, Elena, sorry, I turn it over to you. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, Elena Regan, thanks. Thank you for having me. And um, I'm really happy to be talking with you guys. Um, and, and I love, uh, a little bit about um you know thinking about the historical aspect of the the food um as some of you guys oh something just yes we have a snowstorm going on right now and a windstorm and i just heard something hit the house it was probably just snow falling off of it so it's okay um um anyways so um um what was I saying? Well, about the um, food history part. Well, I'll, I'll I'll eventually tell my story, but I'll just say that um, yeah, I've I graduated from the Art Institute with my master's degree in writing recently, and I've I've published two memoirs. The first one was called "Burn the Place," that came out in 2019, and then my second one called "Fieldwork: A Forager's Memoir." That just recently came out in January of 2023, but um, there was quite a bit of like familial history that I was researching for that book. My next book, because people always say, well, are you ever going to do a cookbook? And um, I have to be honest, I don't have a lot of recipes for having been a chef as long as, as I have. I have a lot of recipes for baking um and things that are a little bit per, more precise and scientific but and and fermentations and you know doing stuff that's a little bit more chemistry driven but um don't have a lot of recipes so writing a cookbook seems really daunting for me however i'm working on a narrative cookbook which is um about my parents restaurant which is in um which was in Gary, Indiana. It was open from 1975 through 1980. And it was like a, a Slavic Polish restaurant. And they used to have um, all the bands come in and play like the Drina Orchestra. And uh, anyways, I'm working on a, a, a cookbook, which is all the, the recipes will be in narrative form. And um and so it's a quite a bit of research, but quite a bit of history, um, you know, tracking down the recipes from my parents and then what they remember of how their parents did it or their grandparents, or if it was the Polish cook Cesha or the um, Serbian cook um, Stana. Uh, so anyways, um, 
I just, I was thinking about that as you guys were talking about some of the food history, um, because I feel like I'm taking a deep dive into Midwestern, um, Eastern European food. So um, that's a lot of fun. So, so as um, Catherine mentioned, I grew up on a small farm. It was about 10 miles south of Gary, Indiana, in, in a town called Hobart. So if anybody's familiar with driving south on I-65, there's an exit for um, Maryville and Cherville. And so when you go east towards um, Maryville, you go a little further east and then just a tiny bit back north, and that is where um, I grew up. Back then, US 30 wasn't it like it was now. Um, it's much more populated with all sorts of things. Uh, I just remember there being the South Lake Mall and maybe the Toys R Us, but aside from that, um, there was the Beer Barrel restaurant. Um, but aside from that, there, there wasn't very much, but something you guys might be familiar with, or maybe not since you're the Illinois Mycological Association, but I will tell you that there is a park called Deep River County Park. That's where the old sawmill is. Um, uh, there is uh, tons of old oak trees there. Um, I want to say it's maybe at least a thousand acres. It might be more. I, I can't recall exactly, but you can probably do a quick Google search and find out. But they have some of the best fall mushrooms, and it's probably only an hour and 20 minute drive from Chicago. And um, so anyways, now you know one of my hen of the woods spots, but I, I don't mind sharing it. Um, and I will also say that if you do go that way, there's an Indiana restaurant that's it's a sandwich shop. It's called Lincoln Carryouts. They have a sandwich there called the Steel Worker. That, that's my favorite sandwich. It's roast beef, American cheese, um, lettuce, tomato, onion on rye bread, and it's kind of grilled like a grilled cheese sandwich. Um, so yeah, that one's called the Steel Worker. Um, and my, I come from a family of steel workers all in um, Northwest Indiana. So they started to come to that area a long time ago. And um, yeah, all of them, my mom's side and my dad's side worked in the mills. And so we were always a, a proud union home. And my dad, when he was young in, in Gary, Indiana, so if you guys know anything about the woods off of the dune shore there, there's, again, lots of old white oak and black, black oak trees, lots of elm. The soil's nice and sandy being, you know, the proximity to the lake. So you have really perfect mushroom growing conditions. So when he was little, uh, well, and I don't know how true this is, but I will say that I've heard people say that, you know, the mushroom hunting always skips a generation. So his mom and dad didn't really hunt for mushrooms, but his grandmother did, and she was from Poland. So she lived in Gary, too, and um, he would go out fishing um, in the creeks and the lakes in that region, and he'd see you know, the way he described it is the old Polish guys out there stooping down and, and looking really closely at the ground. And, um, you know, and one day he says, what are you guys doing? And so they were, you know, a little bit shifty about it because obviously they didn't want to tell this kid about their mushroom spot. But um, he went back and he started looking for what they were looking and figured, okay, well, here's is probably this, this thing. So he began collecting the mushrooms and taking them back to his grandmother, um, who he called Busha. And she would uh, tell him what the mushrooms names were in Polish. So I, I actually have a book that he used to reference with her. And um, he has the names written um, in Polish next to, you know, the scientific names, which is, is really sweet. I, re I really love that book. 
book. Um, I think it was the one printed by the University of Michigan Press, um, like the, the Field Hunter's Guide. It's an old one. I, I want to say it was published in 1968. But that's a that's a fun one to look through if if you I'm sure most of you have probably seen that one. Um, but I will say that um, um, uh, hold on one moment. Damn. Okay, sorry. Um, so, so anyway, so he's finding these mushrooms and obviously gets the itch as, as we all do. And fast forward to many, many years later, um, at that small farm where I grew up, sometimes we would find meadow mushrooms. It was mostly just, um, you know, garden and farm area. It wasn't wooded, this this farm. But um, so we would find meadow mushrooms. And I think that's what first got me really curious about, well, what else is there out there that, that I can eat that we can find? I mean, I was already pretty used to us um, E eating the things that we grew and and you know my mom and dad so I uh, were sort of like uh, homesteaders in a way um, and seed saving canning pickling preserving all that kind of stuff so um, and we we had quite an abundance there so I was already used to to that and but then uh, you know that was really fascinating to find the mushrooms and then my mom and I would go pick wild mulberries and then there was hazelnuts in our front ditch and then we'd go get crab apples and so that really kind of got me curious about everything that was out there in, in the wild even though then that was just my yard so my my grandfather my dad's father when he retired from the mill he bought a hundred acre farm in Madeiraville Indiana and um, which is about, I want to say, uh, an hour and a half probably south of where I grew up, maybe, maybe a little less, maybe about an hour, but it's just south on 421. So if you take 94, like you're going towards um, Ohio, well, into Indiana, and you'll hit like the South Bend area, I think that's exit 421, you go south. Um, and you'll eventually hit Madeiraville, where there is Jasper Pulaski Hunting and Game Preserve. So a little difference than from foraging in some of the Illinois preserves. At this one, you, you go and, and there's a little, next to like the DNR station, there's another little station where you sign in and say what you're doing there, whether it's hunting or sandhill crane watching or mushroom hunting. So you just sign up and you say, I'm going mushroom hunting or I'm foraging and that's it. Nobody really says anything. So again, that area has a really, um, really the abundance of trees that form those wonderful symbiotic relationships with mushrooms. Um, years and years ago, I don't know how many years or hundreds of years or millennia, but that, you know, that, well, at some point, everything was covered in sand or in, in water, right? But that area, that sand, that soil is very sandy. So lots of good mushrooms, lots of morels. That's where we used to hunt morels at my grandfather's farm um, because he had quite a few cornfields, but then quite a bit of ac um, wooded acres and um, chanterelles in the summer and head of the woods in the fall, which I think is mm, probably one of my favorite wild mushrooms. So in the fall, my dad would say, all right, so we're looking for the sheep's head because that's what we called them. And uh, he said they're going to look like a sheep's head right on the ground, right next to the, right next to the tree. Um, so I have very vivid memories of of that. Always hunting for mushrooms on my grandfather's farm. So I now that's a little bit of I I would say some of my most um, you know out outdoorsy vivid memories um but now I'm just going to fast forward for you for when I I became a chef so um for well as as you heard neither of my degrees are in cooking 
but I was always around cooking. I come from a family of restaurant tours, even though they had other side hustles or ma their main jobs were, I think the restaurant was probably their side hustle, but they had other, other jobs. And, um, but nonetheless, definitely with, um, you know, some culinary stuff in their bones. And so I worked in restaurants when I was in high school. And I worked in restaurants all throughout college, um, front and back of the house. And eventually, when I graduated from um, Columbia with my degree in writing, I was 25. And I thought, well, I could either go to graduate school at this time and, and, and get in a lot more debt, or I could really work on doing this restaurant thing. Because I was always in my mind, too, that, you know, someday I want to have a restaurant. But the way it was in my mind was that it was going to be something small, something that was like my original dream was to have this old house where this is when I, I was young. I would say this. I, I'm going to grow vegetables in my backyard and sell them during the day in my front yard. And then when people stop by to buy the vegetables at my farm stand, I'll invite them over for dinner later and I'll have a little restaurant in my house. So anyways, fast forward again, I kind of did that. Um, I started selling pierogies at um, at a farmer's market when I decided, okay, I'm not going to go back to school. I'm going to do this restaurant. This was right around the time where like uh, boutique restaurants sort of uh, took hold, boutique fine dining restaurants. So I realized it was something you didn't really need, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to do. So started selling pierogies at farmer's market. I wanted to build a name for myself. Um, and then people, um, you know, they, they liked what I was doing. Eventually I opened a little underground supper club in my home and that's where I met my investors. And then I opened Elizabeth restaurant. So I will say though, that, um, when I fully started to create menus for myself and started to think about how I want things to look as a chef because prior to that working back of the house I was always cooking what other people were designing but then now here was my time to do what I wanted to do and so I naturally gravitated towards the things that my family the way I grew up you know pickling canning preserving things from the wild no this was in about 2009 and 2010 and I think just as some of those things started to become, you know, the um, farm to table was a big buzzwords and so was foraging and all of that. And I think a lot of times people thought, um, well, this is, you know, a trend or something like that, but, but it's not, and it wasn't because, you know, that's how people have cooked and how they've gathered and how they've grown things for, you know, forever, right? So, um, so, so I the same the same thing that people say about almost anything you you you, you do is like uh, well at least with writing so same thing with cooking is like you write about what you know and and you cook what you know and so I was cooking what I knew and um, so when I opened Elizabeth a lot of that went with me the um, foraging and preserving and being very local but also there's something to that that you know I want to be very conscious about the environment and conscious about how I'm collecting things and conscious about the natural resources that I use so I think after you know almost 10 years of having Elizabeth I certainly got a little bit burnt out I I it, well, it was a small business, right? So um, there was a whole bunch of things that I was doing aside from being the chef, you know, doing the PR and the sales taxes and writing the checks and entering everything into QuickBooks and reconciling the bank accounts. And anyways, I could go on and on about all that stuff that kind of led to a little bit of a burnout, but also something that was in my mind for a while was about... Um, it, and and we were pretty good there about waste and we composted and tried to reuse almost everything that um, we we could. Like if I was going to bring in carrots, I certainly was going to use the tops and then I was going to find use for the skins and not just use like just the 
just the meat of it. So, but there's still waste. There's an extraordinary amount of water that's used on a daily basis in a restaurant. There's just, there's just a lot of stuff. And, and there we only cooked for about 20 to 30 people a day. Um, so I think as time went on, that was also in my mind quite a bit. And um, so I kept thinking, I want to go back to that original idea, you know, like having just something small where I can grow almost everything myself, where I can, um, or just work with a few local farmers very closely and where I can um, forage as much as possible. So uh, for a couple years, I started looking and I found this cabin in the woods. Um, we're in the UP because um, this, this place had quite a bit of acreage um, was sort of the perfect looking cabin for us and was one that we could afford. I think once you get into the north woods of like northern um, w w Wisconsin or Minnesota or northern lower Michigan, you're still about a 20 minute, 25 minute proximity from a, a small town, whereas here we're about an hour and a half to two hours from where we, we are in the woods. So I think that lent to the, you know, a little bit of it being less expensive. It's very rustic. We're on a logging road. So that's why I'm always a little concerned when there are storms because it's very easy for us to get trapped back here because the roads wash out. They're certainly never plowed. Um, and, and we're only here now from, from um, late April and through October because once once the snow comes down, there's there's no getting in or out until it um, is is melted. So, but I'm uh, so I'm sort of doing that that thing that I wanted to do, especially being all the way in the. Um, the middle of the woods out here. We're in the Hiawatha National Forest. So I will tell you that lining my yard, I have in a few weeks, we'll have fiddlehead ferns and spruce shoots. The trout lilies are already coming up. Um, I will, well, I have to search for them, but we'll have some morel mushrooms back here. Um, there's a little bit of wild onions coming up already. Um, by the time the summer hits, we'll have uh, elderflowers and strawberries in the yard. Almost everything is, the, all the ground cover is basically a little wild strawberries. And they're the ones that are so tiny, but they're very sweet. They taste almost like a little sweet tart when you have them. They're exactly what you want a strawberry to taste like. Um, but they're, they're minuscule and you can only collect so many to eat fresh because they're soft too, so they just squish, but they make an excellent vinegar and a really great jam if you can collect enough to make jam, but a good syrup, everything. And I make the vinegar from scratch. So that's one thing I'm also always thinking of when I'm collecting wild ingredients is I'm thinking, how can I stretch this out and how can I preserve it? Because there's no way unless I had a team of foragers, which I don't want to have, could I collect enough, you know, wild strawberries to serve everybody a big, you know, strawberry shortcake or something. So um, I'm always thinking about how can I take exactly what I need, still give the people the flavor and present it and show them how great all these wild things are, but also being conscious about how much we're using and, um, you know, obviously leaving plenty out there. So then we have uh, blueberries and blackberries and we have prickly gooseberry. Um, we have nettles, uh, lobster mushrooms start to happen in late July through September, which we just get an abundance of. Um, I love those so much. Bear's tooth mushroom, which is like lion's mane that tastes just like crab meat. Um, lots of oyster mushrooms. Oh, you know what? Now that I'm realizing it's snowing, I could probably even get some sap out of the maples. Well, no, they had some 80 degree days a couple weeks ago. Anyways, there's, there's a lot of things. Uh, the list can go on and on. Um, but so when when people come here, 
I, you know, I get to show them all these different things and in all these different ways. Um, so that kind of is, you know, it's not like my Chicago restaurant where occasionally I could order a fancy Ocetra caviar and put it in a little tart and there's the dish and it's delicious. Um, collecting all the little tiny blueberries is its own, you know, sort of precious high-end thing. It's forest caviar. So there's there's just, um, yeah, there's this wonderful thing that we get to be out and do and all these things to collect. And sometimes we have uh, foraging classes up here where we bring um, people out and they stay Monday through Wednesday. And um, on Monday night, I cook them a meal and I sh talk about a lot of my ferments and vinegars because I think that way I get to teach them a little bit to think about how when they're outside, what they can um, be collecting and, and how they can preserve it. And then on the following day, Tuesday, I show them how to make my bread and we, we collect, we go out and we forage for a little bit. And then we come back and I show them how to make my pasta. And then the, some of the things that we forage, we put in the pasta for dinner. And then on Wednesday, they leave. So I think that that might be something that some of you out there would be interested in. Um, we are full for this year, but we still have to, we still have to um, get some settled for 2024. So, so keep that in mind, because I'd love to see you guys here. Um, when I'm back in Chicago, um, my wife and I, we teach an eight-week cooking course. Um, so if any of you are in the Chicago area, we do that on Sundays. And um, and sometimes we have pop-ups. So it's kind of like I go back to my, my roots right before I had a restaurant and we do pop-ups out of our home. But I know, I know I've been talking for about 20 minutes. It's 8 30 now and I think we we I think people are interested in asking some questions so um uh Catherine will you be doing kind of yes the yes I will take care of that so okay. where are the Chicago classes on Sundays so the the restaurant I used to own is called uh Atelier now so when I left there I gave it to one of my employees he was sort of my ride or die and um he he um ran it as elizabeth for a little bit and then um and then the the chef who he and i both knew left and so he decided to kind of make it his own thing so now it's called atelier it's in lincoln square um and that's where anna and i teach classes so i teach a um like about an hour and 20 minute food portion. And then she finishes the class by teaching the, um, the wine portion, which sort of corresponds to what the food may be. Um, and then um, I we always have a meal too. So whatever we're doing in class that day, I turn it into a meal for us. So that's awesome. I did see one of the questions pop up on my screen, which was, um, how do you get on you know, how do you know about the pop-ups and the classes and things? So right now we do everything through um, our Milkweed website. So if you go to um, milkweedin.com, uh, at, at the bottom of the landing page, there is a um, newsletter sign up. We, we sign up for, um, or we, we send out maybe like one mailing a month. We don't try to, you know, bombard your email boxes or anything like that. But that usually you know, gets gets everybody information about like if there's opening at milkweed, if when we're doing our winter classes, if we're doing pop-ups, um, and and if anybody is on here who is maybe not in Illinois, like when we do our out-of-state stuff, because sometimes I go to other uh, other um, restaurants um, and do collaborations and things like that. So there was a question about lobster mushrooms wondering what you do with those because this person usually cooks them in butter so give me your best prep as oh. she suggested or your best idea anyway a good idea yeah well I mean I I 
I mean, I really kind of do something similar. So uh, I'll, I'll just tell you a couple things. Um, one is I will clean them up real nice and um, I serve them in a pasta dish. So I usually make like a stinging nettle pasta and I just very simply saute the um, the lobster mushrooms in a little bit of butter and then I usually add like a, a pea shell stock or something to it then I throw all the pasta in I crack a couple egg yolks into it add some more butter a little bit of like wild um you know vinegar like a strawberry vinegar or milkweed vinegar or something um and then top it with cheese so Simple like that. I've also made like schnitzel out of them because of the wonderful texture. So taking like a, you know, a little bit of a breading and um, um, basically like coating them in cornstarch, then in a little bit of um, whipped egg and then mix them with the, with the breading. And I always like to add like garlic powder and onion powder and paprika salt and pepper to my my breading and then again sauteing them in butter so even though I'm kind of like a you know quote unquote fine dining chef I think that there's something to be said for just you know highlighting that ingredient and making it as simple as possible I I have a I have a sense just out of curiosity when you cook are you sort of like like the old fashioned, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and it all kind of comes together, not real yeah. recipes. Right. That's exactly why I don't want to write a cookbook. <laughs> I, I, I could expect that could be daunting. Uh, yeah. Can you recommend a good beginner fermentation project? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, sauerkraut. So think of anything that um, you can salt ferment. So salt fermenting is like a, a lactic acid fermentation. So I, I will tell you that there's a couple books that I really love, and especially if you like wild things. The guy's name is Pascal Boudar, um, P, and I don't know if I said that right, but P-A-S-C-A-L and last name B-A-U-D-A-R. He's got a series of wild crafting in fermentation books. Um, you can also find him on Instagram and a lot of times he'll post like quite lengthy um, recipes of not only fermentation projects, but things that you can do. Mo most of them, it's things that are fermented from the wild. So yeah, somebody said Pascal's amazing. Yeah, he's, he's really incredible. So I would recommend um, checking out those books because you'll learn about wild things and fermentation together. Are there any wild plants from the UP that were new to you? Oh yeah, lot, lots of them. Um, so uh, just one for example though, I will say is um, plantain, which, which may have been honestly um, it, in other places too, but uh, it was all over our front yard and I didn't even think about it twice until I had one of my foraging classes and somebody from um, from Northern Michigan came to it and said, oh, that's plantain. And so, so I was like, oh yeah, I didn't know. That's kind of the great thing about it too, is we, we learn a lot together. Um, and yeah, so, so um, I would say that that's, that's one of, um, but there's definitely been a few. What's your process for learning about new items you find? Well, the way that I've always done it, so when I when I was growing up with my dad, he's very, very anxious. So we stuck to the mushrooms that were no lookalikes, you know, very easy to identify. So for years, that's all I, I collected. And I always tell people I'm not a mycologist because it's unbelievable because people know how much I love foraging, but at the same time, I, I'm still learning and I'm not a I'm not a mycologist. So um, um, I've, oh, but over the years, especially as I got more and more into food, I was um, picking up whatever kind of edible plant book is out there. And then I'm often in the woods too. So even before here, right? So um, I would see things that I'd read about in the book. 
out in the wild and 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 I and then vice versa I'd be out in the wild and then I'd go back to my books and then I'd you know it was kind of like cross-referencing over time um almost like that memory game where you turn over the cards and you got to remember where they are you know it was like the book I was learning and then out in the wild I was seeing and then eventually they came together but every so often too I have to go back to the books and thumb through them again because there's just so much and to learn everything so you know that's not my primary my primary job you know like I said I'm not a mycologist or a biologist so um or you know I I need to kind of um constantly refresh myself when we do these foraging classes um uh, oftentimes people will collect every single mushroom that they see and ask me what all of them are and I mean I might know a few but what we and definitely I'll know the edible ones right but we I say well let's figure it out right so we bring them back and we do uh we do spore prints on them and then I have a upper peninsula mushroom guide and then we'll try to identify them that way um and obviously we're not going to eat anything that we can't 100 positively identify um and you know that's definitely my my number one rule and even then even if sometimes I can identify it and I'm pretty sure I got the ID on it. Um, if it has lookalikes, then I I still probably you know don't don't touch it, and that's that's part of my my dad's anxiety in me, I think. But I like I like to be very cautious. But but yeah, it's just um, um, been from reading. I, I hope I didn't get too sidetracked. Was that the question? I hope I no answered. no no that that was okay. excellent and an it, it, excellent that you made the people I, I i've had that where they pick everything but you mm -hmm. made them learn which is a good yeah. thing me too yeah yeah so, so there, there's nothing wrong and a hundred percent i mean that anxiety isn't isn't because there's it, the anxiety is built on prior experience and things can go really wrong you know it's 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 not the worst thing so even though milkweed in is full this year if i'm in the area can i stop by to see the inn well if you were in the area and you wanted to stop by you absolutely could but you would have to be willing well you'd need a four-wheel drive vehicle probably and then you'd have to be willing to drive down that logging road which is we're 11 miles down the logging road so that takes about 45 minutes um just to get down it but yeah if anybody wanted to come by i'd be happy to give you a tour now now if somebody else asked if the, if if milkweed could they come and have a dinner there if they were in that area or that simply they could get a tour but come back another day yeah, we can't. So because we are just licensed as as a bed and breakfast, like it's um, we can't just serve individual meals. Unfortunately, it has to sort of be the whole package. So stopping by is an absolute, you know, and if I we happen to be eating sandwiches for lunch, that would be fine. But, you know, um, as for like the the meals that happen on Friday, Saturday, Saturday and Sunday for the when when guests are here because those are the only days we operate um with guests is Friday through Sunday um and during during the week it, it's my wife and myself and we usually have one or two residents so it's a you know very small uh, operation and so we spend most of the week you know flipping the rooms and sanitizing and foraging and processing ingredients and working in the garden and you know so there's everything sorts sorts so, sort of leads up to that weekend um i know i think i heard the answer but what is your favorite fungi to forage oh well my favorite one well maybe now my favorite one to forage is lobster mushrooms but my favorite one to heat i think if i had to choose is hen of the woods but it might be my new one might be um bear's tooth which i didn't really start having until um i got up here it was wasn't until i was up here that i found it but i but, but i believe that they grow on oaks 
maybe everywhere. I just, I had never found one in, in Indiana before. Um, how would you use apple blossoms? Well, I would certainly, um, probably, well, it depends on how many, but maybe infuse them in a vinegar that's already made or use them, the petals as like in a salad. Um, but to make a vinegar out of scratch from it would, I, I, I wouldn't want to collect that many blossoms from the tree. You could always try to do the thing that um, um, they do in Japan with the cherry blossoms where they salt them to preserve them. Um, I can't, the, the name of that process is escaping me now. But anyways, it's essentially a salt fermentation. So there's a couple things. Um, you can do with apple blossoms, but I, I would, I have actually right now in, in my basement, uh, a bottle of vinegar that has some stuffed in there. And it also just looks pretty. How many rooms do you have at the inn? We have a main cabin, which Anna and I and the dogs live in. And, and so we have, uh, we have our own room and then it has three additional rooms in this main cabin. Um, and each room hosts two guests. And then we have an Airstream, which is a 16 foot Bambi Airstream. And um, we have that, that also is an accommodation. And then two wall tents, which are on platforms um, that have like little wood burning stoves in them. So um, that's more like the glamping aspect of it. Um, so we can accommodate 12 total. We usually only have 10 though, because we, all, we only have 12 at the height of summer when, when we know everybody can comfortably sit outside. But, um, but yeah, so we accommodate 10, 10 to 12 people. Do you have a simple recipe for elderflower fizz drinks? Mm. Elderflower drinks, uh, no ever fermented them in that kind of way to like um, get them fizzy and then stop the fermentation at that point. I have definitely made elderflower vinegar um, with them, which in that case, I take the elderflower and by weight add about 30 to 40% raw honey. Um, and then, so say I have them stuffed in a jar, I'll, you know, have the raw honey in there and I'll just fill it with water to the top of where the elderflowers come to. And I'll put like a cheesecloth over the top with um, like a string to just hold, hold it there. Um, and every day, maybe twice a day, I'll go in with a really clean spoon and mix it up. And after like the second or third day, you'll start to see the fermentation in that. And um, that would probably be a point where it could be a fizz drink. But um, uh, I, I would just say, again, that the, the Pascal Budar guy in his books, he definitely has exact recipes for making um, fermented drinks. A lot of times he'll use like a raw, raw um, organic ginger to kind of start it, he'll he'll use a starter first. Um, so, but when I'm making the vinegar, I usually see that fizz part, and then I let it go well well past that, so that it turns to first, you know, it's the the sugars and the yeast going, and then it turns sort of to alcohol, and then it turns to vinegar. Um, but there are ways to stop that in 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 the um, in between times. But there are people who use um, like starters, just like you would use a, a bread starter. Mm -hmm. Was there another question? Oh, here, I'll, I'll go to the chat. I see Kathy popped off, I think. Okay, my favorite way to preserve ribs. Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> oh, that's... I, 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 I muted myself, sorry. Go, go answer the ramps and then there's two other questions above. Okay, so the ramps, what I like to do is, again, I don't like to over harvest them and, and I don't pick the bulbs, but I blend them into egg yolks and I make a pasta out of that. And 
Um, well, this is being recorded, so um, I was going to say if you have a pen and paper ready, I do have my pasta recipe off the top of my head. Um, my standard re recipe for pasta is 360 grams of bread flour or double zero flour, 19 egg yolks or 300 grams of egg yolks, 12 grams of olive oil, and a couple pinches of salt. I'm just going to mute myself. For Are you okay. back? Okay, we hear you. Great. We, um, so I, anyways, when I'm making that pasta, I blend in the ramps into the egg yolks and um, I make the pasta dough. And then um, I'll usually do it in a pretty big batch though and cut it into portions that are reasonable. And then that's one way that I preserve the ramps. Um, also, I see somebody just meant dehydrating. Yeah, dehydrating is a great way and in turning into powder. Another nice thing is, uh, is um, well, you could always make a compound butter. So chopping them up and then softening them butter and adding them to the butter, especially if you dehydrate them and make them in that powder form. Um, but, um, and, and then sometimes too, I will just freeze them um, I'll, you know, maybe seal them in a vacuum seal baggie and freeze them. And then when you take them out and do it fresh, and then when you take it out, it's already like they've been blanched. So if you're going to ever put them in something after you've frozen them, you just want to squeeze out some of that water. Um, but then you can use it just as if you had, you know, boiled them first for a few minutes. Um, so yeah. Lots of very imaginative, and you're right about not picking the bulbs because that's mm -hmm. the thing that gets, let's say, forest rangers, park rangers, just crazy. Is when you pull up the whole plant. Mm -hmm. that, that's the, one of the issues with 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 ramps. But how do you suggest preparing trout lilies? Well, trout lilies, um, I like to ferment those. They taste a little bit like cucumber. Um, and so like we were talking about sauerkraut earlier, um, I don't, the, these are much more tender, so you don't have to massage it like you do with um, cabbage. But I will take the trout lilies, just the leaves. Again, I, I rarely ever disturb the root system, though. The little bulbs that you can pull out are really quite delicious but but I I just use the leaves and I will um weigh them out and by weight I'll measure out like one and a half to two percent salt and I'll mix them with that and then I put them in a vacuum seal baggie or something that's going to keep it airtight because when you're doing a lactic um fermentation or a lacto fermentation um that has to be anaerobic so you don't want air getting to it um but a food saver is a, is uh is a vacuum seal machine that they sell at I, I know not everybody can grab you know miscellaneous equipment but it's a little bit more on the reasonable side than some other um you know vacuum chambers that are out there that chefs use um and that does the job quite nicely. So so that is one way. Another way is just simply brushing with olive oil, salt and pepper, and a little bit of spices and grilling. Um, you can always add them to a salad, like the, the, the flowers when those come up. Um, those are really pleasant. They taste like cucumber a little bit, a little bit like cucumber, onion, and potato all together. Um, by the way, uh, this the, uh, Donna says, I realize this is a beginner's questions, but I'm a beginner. So I'm curious about morel rush mushrooms. Why are they so great and what do they taste like? Uh, no, that's a really good question. Well, I think that morels have quite a, a meaty flavor. And I think that that's why some so many people are so wild for them because if you saute them in butter with a little salt and pepper, really that's kind of like all you need for it, right? They're just so good. And um, um, I've even heard some people say that they'll eat them with A1 steak sauce. And, and I 
don't think that's a bad idea. I think that that sounds really good. Just like a little use that as a dip or something. Um, but I think the reason why they are so sought after is like, it's almost like that thing where like people love to chase things that they can't have. And morale's very, I, I think now, Maybe there's been somebody to break through and has been able to cultivate them, but they can't be cultivated uh, for the most part, or at least not easily. Um, one year you might find them in one spot. You might find a whole carpet of them and think, oh, I'm going to go back to that place every year. And then they'll never be there again. And then one day they might just be, I mean, my, my, one of my professors from the Art Institute, she just texted me a photo yesterday of um, her home in Michigan. Her husband pulled up and they had morels growing out of the gravel in their driveway. And I just thought, and she never knew what they were before till she actually came to one of my pop-ups, which was so funny. And um, she's she has them in her driveway. So I wish I could be that lucky to just pull up to my, my home and have them in my driveway. But I think that's the thing. I think that you never know exactly if they're going to be there. Or at least for me, I still have yet to find my, my for sure spot. Um, and yeah, they're just kind of elusive. So, What does uh, summer foraging look like in the UP? Well, lots of mosquito bites and tons of ticks. So it's not, you know, it's not, I think a lot of people have romantic ideas of being out in the woods, you know, skipping with baskets, like, you know, Little Red Riding Hood or something, but it's like, you know, so many bugs and such a mess. And then you got to clean everything and make sure you're going to preserve it and, and all that stuff. So there's that. It's hot and sweaty, but there is there is definitely an abundance, um, like I said. But in, in this case, it's mostly, um, for me, a lot of greens and berry picking. So, uh, like I said, there's the strawberries, and then we get the blueberries, and then the blackberries. Um, then eventually we, we get into, like, wild apples. But, you know, that's a little bit more September and October. But, yeah, lo lots of berries, lots of greens. Um, I know we're coming close to the end, but how far in advance do you plan your menu for guests? Or is it something you do ahead of time or plan that day based on what you find? Uh, well, it's a little bit of both. So I generally have an idea of the structure of what my menu may be. Um, and, but um, that's what I love about being here is because, you know, it's, it depends on what nature's gonna give us. Um, and also we um, go to Marquette, which is like the biggest small town up here. And that's where Northern Michigan University is and they have a farmer's market um, a couple times a week. So we work with a couple farmers there where we get a CSA. So I don't really know what um, exactly my ingredients are gonna be until I go pick up my box. And same thing with what's happening in the woods. Like I could think like, oh yeah, I would like to do this thing with blueberries, but sometimes I, um, you know, it might not be a good blueberry year, you know? So it, it really, I can't really out here create my menu until it's pretty close to, to time to execute it. Well, I think we have come to the conclusion, though somebody did want to know about snowshoeing and cross-country skiing. Oh, I think by that time, you're gone, right? We we are. Um, but, you know, like, look at today. Like, you know, there's, there's a snowstorm. And, well, there's probably not enough for snowshoeing. But that is one of Anna and my goals, because now we've, we've made quite a few friends up here who love to like backcountry ski and snowshoe. And so we're, we're definitely planning on coming back in the winters to do that. Um, but before I go, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. And this has been really nice. Um, and I hope some of you guys get my books and, and read in um, because there'll be a whole lot more of me talking about all the forage things I love, particularly in field work. Um, 
and yeah, sign up for our mailing list um, on the milkweed website um, because we got all sorts of things that are going on aside from here, and and a lot of things that you know aren't big ticket items. Um, and also um, we're happy to work with people um, oftentimes on pay what you can and we have scholarship initiatives and things like that. So um, there's always ways to do stuff with us no matter what your budget. And, and by the way, I think Kelly kind of said it, which I was, I had the feeling was gonna be people's reaction. She goes, you are living my dream life. <laughs> it's such a wonderful talk. You've inspired me to start fermenting more and I forage already. So thank you for some great ideas. All right, good. Great. Thank you and, very much. And I will send a copy of the chat to her. I know we, we bumped the ceiling on our uh, attendance tonight. So I will be editing this tonight. It will be up on the website. So whatever you missed, we'll be able to see in the morning. Elena, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And right. uh, we'll keep in touch. Thanks again. Right. Good. Good night. Good night, everybody.